My name is Revan and welcome to this tutorial on the exercises from the book Theoretical Neuroscience by Diane and Abbott. A uh, little word of introduction. I have put together a GitLab with the exercises that I have solved so far, which is open source and you can just go ahead and look through the codes yourself if you prefer and if not this tutorial is meant to serve as an introduction and it will also hopefully guide you through the code should there be any specific questions that you might have about the exercises. Now while reading the book itself is extremely useful for the applications of computational and theoretical neuroscience, um, not doing the exercises will leave you with perhaps half of the useful knowledge that you might gain from this tremendous work. Um, however, as much as I searched, I couldn't find anywhere on the internet um, well-documented, correct and complete set of solutions to these exercises. And that can be quite a problem since you don't know if you're doing them correctly. And so as a result of that, I have decided to take on these exercises myself and see if I can put together a complete and correct solution. Now, a word of warning, the exercises were originally intended to be done in MATLAB. However, I am doing them in Python. Now there's a few reasons for this. Um, while I don't think that there is a clear winner between MATLAB and Python, both have their advantages and disadvantages, um, MATLAB is certainly easier to learn and more accessible, especially because of the interface. However, I think it is worth learning Python in the current climate of computational and theoretical neuroscience, partly because it is open source and it is becoming more and more popular. And I think it will overtake MATLAB in popularity at some point for the applications of theoretical neuroscience. That said, we can go ahead and get started. So I am using a Jupyter Notebook, which is a um, free software that you can use to um, write Python code and immediately visualize it um, in a very friendly format, which allows you to see your results straight away and chunk your code into different um, into different um, sections, so to speak. So um, while I use other Python environments as well, like PyCharm, um, this is the most friendly um, format that I could think of to uh, do these exercises and to immediately show you the results and the figures. So um, let's get straight into the code. The first exercise asks to create a Poisson spike generator um, and then run this generator to create some data and then to subsequently analyze this data by computing the coefficient of variation and also the Fano factor. So there is some theoretical knowledge um, worth knowing from the book regarding um, spikes, how they're generated artificially, why we generate them like that, and in what way can um, the coefficients of variation and the final factor inform us about the nature of the spikes and what generated them. Side note here, we are using the Poisson point process generator, uh, which is not the same thing as the Poisson distribution. Um, those two are related, however. Um, you can read more about it on Wikipedia, which is a, a really solid page about the Poisson point process. So um, the idea is that um, if you have a collection of random points in space um, from a Poisson process, then the number of points in a specific region is a random variable with a Poisson distribution. Um, so those two are related in this manner. 
um, there are two main types of the pass on point process, uh, which are called homogeneous and inhomogeneous. And the difference here is that in the inhomogeneous case, the uh, lambda, so the probability of generating a point, varies over time. Um, but in the homogeneous Poisson process, um, this probability stays constant. So that is the assumption that we're making here, that the firing rate doesn't change. So to start things off, this notebook um, uses only four modules in Python, and I imported them all at the beginning so that you don't have to do it every single time. So all of these are necessary for the a total of 10 parts that the first chapter has. Um, the PyPlot library here is just used for creating all of the figures. The NumPy library, normally imported as NP, is used for some mathematical operations, which you might be more familiar if you're using MATLAB as being native, but in Python you actually have to import this library. Um, and then we have Pandas, which is um, kind of like the tables in MATLAB, uh, which allows you to conveniently manipulate data, uh, put them into tables uh, here called data frames or lists here called series. Um, and it's, it's much more friendly to use than the native Python data formats, some of them. And then lastly, we also have SciPy signal. You don't have to worry about this one too much um, as of right now. Um, it's a little bit more niche and uh, a lot of what it does uh, can actually be done with NumPy. Um, but I chose to import it here because it will become important later for some very specific applications. And um, I also created the seed so that um, if you rerun this code with um, this specific seed, you should um, get the same results as I did. So anyway, uh, let's get started. So the Poisson spike generator, we need to first create a couple of variables. So the time vector, um, we need to um, assign the firing rate. Um, and um, then we can um, feed that into the native NumPy Poisson um, function. So for the lambda, just like you see in the book, this is actually a product of the firing rate and um, the time step. Now, why is that? Well, um, we are taking the, um, we are doing the tick marks for whenever there's a spike, but we are doing that in a kind of discrete manner in a small time step. So every one millisecond, um, we check for the spike. And so obviously if the firing rate is 100 Hertz, we don't even expect um, a single spike to be present during that period of time, but rather every 10 times that we would expect one spike. Now, um, we also assign the time vector. So we want to see how many spikes we get over the course of this entire um, trial which um, they ask us to make 10 seconds. So you can make it longer if you want, but this is more than what we need for the purposes to illustrate how the Poisson spike process works. And then um, we are interested in um, only single spikes. So this is an assumption that we only ever obtain one spike in a given time period, in a given time step. So every time you have more than one spike, um, I would suggest just changing that to one so that we don't violate this assumption. The idea here is that the, in order for the mathematics to work, as far as I understand it, um, we need to operate with the assumption that only one spike can be produced um, in this very, very short period of time here, yeah, that being one millisecond. Um, 
we are then interested in taking the time, so the spec. So we essentially ran this for 10 seconds and now we want to take the timestamps. Um, and out of that, we want to create the inter spike interval. So this is actually um, the meat of the matter. This is um, the, 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 the really interesting part. And um, I plotted that here using the um, pi plot. And uh, that's what it looks like. So it is um, a heavily skewed distribution wherein the highest inter spike interval is actually approaching zero. So um, the idea is that it's much more likely that you will have spikes separated by a smaller period of time rather than a longer period of time, um, which is actually what the um, which is exactly what the Poisson distribution would predict. Um, so this follows the sort of um, downwards exponential train trend. Now, the next thing to look at is the actual distribution of the spike counts. So here we plotted the inter-spike intervals. However, um, it is worth taking a step back from this actually and plotting the um, spike counts themselves. Now, what does this mean? Uh, if I were to count the number of spikes in a given interval, um, first we need to specify that interval and um, given that our uh, pre-specified time step is one millisecond and we only assume one spike and only one spike can ever be present in this uh, interval, we need to extend that a little bit. So say we extend it to 50 milliseconds. And as I said in the previous section of the video, um, the Poisson process produces the Poisson distribution. Um, and this is um, actually present here. So the counts uh, as a random variable, we can plot them, plot the number of spikes that we actually observe in these um, 50 millisecond long bins um, using just the simple um, using just the simple function to count uh, the number of spikes. Um, so uh, this is just um, uh, this is just uh, a window um, wherein we move 50 milliseconds and then we count the number of spikes and then we move to the next 50 milliseconds and so on. And uh, out of that, we get this kind of crude uh, distribution of spikes. And as you may notice, this actually approximates the uh, Poisson distribution. Now, a Poisson distribution, um, if you have a, a large enough number of spikes, is actually really well approximated by the normal distribution. So you can see this in the book um, in figure in figure 111. So that is right here. So this is the normal distribution, which is um, really well approximating the Poisson distribution of the spike counts that uh, they obtained here. Um, now, the idea here is that if you are a proficient mathematician, you would know that the Poisson distribution is only parameterized by uh, a single value, lambda, which is both the variance and the nor and the mean. Uh, so technically speaking, uh, the first moment, uh, the first row moment and the second central moment are actually equal to each other. And therefore, if we take the ratio of these two, that is, if we divide the mean or the variance by the mean, it should just produce one. Um, and that is called the final factor. So that is what they ask us to compute. And um, they ask us to do it over uh, intervals ranging from one millisecond to 100 millisecond. I did it for three intervals here. So for the one millisecond interval, it's just the variance um, of the spike is divided by the mean and um, that actually comes out to be um, 0 0.906. Um, so that's not quite one, but we are doing it over a very small time interval and it's actually much more accurate if you do it over a long interval. So um, 100 milliseconds 
produces uh, 0.958, which is pretty close to one. So um, this is actually a pretty good result. It is um, telling that indeed we are approximating um, the Poisson distribution here uh, with this Poisson process. And if the world were perfect, we would get a value that is exactly equal to one, um, which is actually demonstrated here um, um, in the book. It is derived in Appendix B, if you so desire to read more about this. Um, but um, the idea is that the variance is equal to the mean, and that is the lambda. This is an interesting corollary, which is the higher the lambda, the higher is the mean of the distribution, but also the wider the distribution gets. So there is a relationship between the width of the distribution and the mean of the distribution. So that's quite interesting. Now, the second thing that the exercise asks us to do is to calculate the coefficient of variation, but not of the counts, but of the interspike intervals instead. So we are actually going to be using this distribution to calculate that. And um, in particular, we do that here by just taking the mean of the ISI and the um, standard deviation of the ISI. Um, I also calculated the variance, but that's not actually what you need at all. Um, and the coefficient of variation is just simply the ratio between these two. So it is the standard deviation divided, um, divided by the mean. And importantly, this also takes the value of one for a homogeneous Poisson process. Um, and the book tells us that it is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition to identify a Poisson spike trait. Um, and um, the um, other Thing to take home from this is that um, for any renewal process, the Fano factor, if you evaluate it for a, a long time intervals, it, appro it actually approaches the squared value of the coefficient of variation. So it's just tends towards um, it just tends towards that value. Um, and obviously, if you take the square of one, um, then that is also going to be one. So in an ideal world, if you have perfect mathematics for the Poisson process and the, um, and, and the, 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 the homogeneous Poisson process, and then you plot the interspike interval from that, um, over uh, an arbitrarily long period of time and um, you calculate the final factor and the coefficient of variation, both of those will be exactly equal to one. And that is sort of empirically approached um, here in our case. So that is the first exercise done. Just a very quick side note here. It is really relevant to point out that the experimentally derived Fano factor and the coefficients of variation um, are actually really surprisingly well um, corresponding to the theoretical values derived from a Poisson process. So I think it's quite fair to say that we have established in neuroscience, in empirical neuroscience, that neurons fire randomly and irregularly in some way and um, the the statistics of the spike trains are approximating the Poisson statistics if you were to generate the spikes with a Poisson process. Now there is um, um, for instance this paper from Science um, from uh, 1997 which shows um, that if you drive a neuron with a stimulus um, and you look at the variance and the mean, it is 
pretty remarkably um, correlated and the coefficient of variation um, actually approaches unity in this case. And this is actually true across the recordings and across um, electrophysiology uh, as a whole, as in there are a lot of instances of people having recorded from um, neurons in a variety of conditions um, and, and then they actually observed that this coefficient of variation or the final factor were um, near unity as would be predicted by um, this being a Poisson point process. So that is just something to think about. And um, there are still a lot of remaining questions in neuroscience as to how and why the neurons fire when they do. And um, this can provide part of the answer.